Yes, yes, yes. ma'am. Now, now I would like to call upon Dr. Parameshwar. Is Dr. Parameshwar Singh here? Uh, I think he is not here, ma'am. Because I cannot it's find his name. Uh, so. I think Ms. Ampu is ready with her presentation. The other presenters of the session are Kareer Riba, Isha Seeger, Mr. Bharatwaj. Hello, Ampu. Good evening. Uh, good evening, ma'am. And I'm so sorry for the morning sessions. Actually, my data got over. So now I want to uh, I want to present my paper again. So first of all, I would like to say thank you so much for giving me the opportunity again. Yeah, so uh, uh, I'm on Futurangpi. So my paper is on Chomankan Interpreting Kirby Festival, Life and Death. So uh, the Kirby, uh, generally known as Arling, literally a man or human, is one of the major ethnic group of Northeast India. They live in the hilly district of Kirby Anglong, Assam. They are also found across other districts in Assam. Besides Assam, they are also found in another part of the Northeast India like Meghalaya and Arunachal Pradesh. They are believed to be one, one of the earliest migrants from Central Asia through the great mountain range of Himalayas to Western China near the Wangsi Kiang and Wanghu rivers. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Um, so through these places, they became down the course of Brahmaputra to Chinmin Iravadi's rivers in Burma and entered to Northeast India. Racially, they belong to the Mongoloid group and linguistically, they belong to the Tibeto Burman group, which come under the Sino Tibetan family of languages. Kirby are basically an agrarian tribe and they practice both jhum cultivation as well as wetland cultivation. Jhum cultivation is practiced in the seasons of spring from March to May, whereas wetland is practiced in the season of monsoon, which start from June till the middle of September. They are expert in wood carving and bamboo craft, especially by the men, and textile weaving for the women. According to their social structures, the Kirby's have five exogamous clans known as Nokum. These are Yizang, Hanjang, Yizang, Kronjang, and Tungjang. Each clan is further divided into subclans. The Kirby traditionals and social administrative is led by the chief known as Lin Dokpo. King, along with Pim Po's members of King cabinets and the Habes, the regional chief under the king. Each Habe has, has his own territory. The village has to be looked after the wrong sarte, the village headman. The Kirby, the Kirby's have, the Kirby's have a very distinct traditions and culture. They have a very rich traditions of folklore. These folklore have, have survived for a long time through oral transmissions. Baptist missionary introduced writing in Kirby language using. Roman script, but only in recent time have the Kirby started recording their folklore in written format. The Kirby's follow the traditional religion called Aranban, which are vernaculars believe and practices. The Kirby rituals and practices are associated with their religious belief and their harvesting season. Most of their festi festivities are communal festivals. Some festivals celebrated by the Kirby's are the wrong care for the well-being of the villagers, the children worshipping of the household deity and ancestor spirit and the Chomankan funeral festival. There are also some rituals practice that are not communal in nature, like the Tirim Pangduk ancestor worship. 
they have a rich well or well of their folklore such as in oral literature sometimes called verbal art or expressive literature they are found in their origin mid kiplang folk songs or folk poetry folk tales proverbs riddles fairy tales charms lament songs etc they are also found in their physical folk life generally called material culture we can also look into their traditional architecture textile weaving wood carving and basketry food furniture and utility etc and also into their folk custom traditions communal festival and their practices of religious ritual they also have a rich traditions of performing folk art such as traditional music dance and drama among among this all we see that one of their most important folk performing arts in Chom uh, chomongkan festival Chomongkan. Chomongkan, also called Chomongkan or Karhi, in a funeral festival, which is the festival of life and death, practiced by the Karbi. It is believed to be a tradition taught by a mythical character known as Thiring Wangreng. Dead alive come alive who travels between the two walls of the dead and the living with equal ease. According to the tradition, the other wall is the inverted image of the wall of the living. Chumongkan is a communal festival. It is a very significant to them. The festival reveals the concept of death, life and death. The Kurdish believe in Karjong, soul, which is immortal and in rebirth, and rebirth of death and relative, both male and female to the same clan. The deceased person's Karjong return as mentry, incarnate personality to his or her corresponding clan. Ceremony of life can be passed through three phases, that are separations, transitions, and incorporations. Rites of separations are prominent in funeral ceremonies. The rites of incorporation at marriages also played an important part, for instance, in pregnancy, betrothal, and initiations, or they may be reduced in minimum in adoption, in the delivery of a second child, in remarriage, or in the passage from the second to the third age group. For the deceased person, the soul needs to be sanctified to reach a place called Puki Arong, grandfather and grandmother's village, ancestral village, which is euphemism for the wall of the dead. This is right of separations reflect the concept of Ben Ganex about rites of passage. If the Chomongkan is not performed for the deceased member, it is believed that the soul will not get a chance to stay at the Puki Arong. The soul remains trapped in luminous space. The soul is in this period of margin, is between the wall of living and the ancestor village. This is the liminal stage. It is believed that the Karjong will be staying in Sanchong or Ridlo Parlo near the age of Kupi Arong. To send the Karjong to this place, they need to sanctify the soul of the disease. That is why they need to perform the Chomongkan. Another belief is that if they do not perform the Chomongkan for many decades or centuries, Many of the living families members will die sooner. The member of the disease for whom Chamongkan has not been performed is more. The soul will be unhappy who keep calling the living people from the family and it will not grant blessing and prosperity. So in this situation, the liminal soul is at the age at the edges where it belongs neither here nor there and in a difficult position. The soul in the liminal period, according to the worldview of the Karbis, is an unstable situation for the liminal soul in Karbis. We can observe two phases of funeral ceremonies. The first phase is when a person dies, a funeral takes place for her cremation. The second phase is the Chomongkan funeral festival, which is the rite of separations, which reflect the concept of when Ganep write passage of separations. The Lunsipi, a female dirt singer, plays an important role in Karbi funeral ceremony. She is an elderly woman who supervises the funeral ceremony, following her leadership are a group of female assistants called Charhe Pimar. They sing the Char Charhe, a lemon song for the disease. The Lunsipi perform true oral singing, the detailed treatment of the journey of the soul. 
next to Chagunse Peak is the Uche Peak Cook for the Disease, who is also an elderly woman. The Uche Peak Cook for and feed the soul of the disease. Though the soul is released from the body, it does not reach the eternal place called Kupi Aram. As stated, the soul will wander between the wall of the living and the wall of the dead, which means betwixt and between. This is Turner applications of Van Gannett concept of transition or liminality. Chomongkan is an elaborate process. It involves lots of people. It is a complex and multi-layer cultural and social event which cannot be simplified and become a chaotic, colorful, and extravagant festival. And it takes months and sometimes years to prepare, involving a huge network of people from the clan, the sense groups, and villagers which drain the financial resource of the host. To perform a Chamangkan, a keen member from both male and female lineage, particularly the Ong Nihu, mother's brother's maternal uncle, Soso Pili, sister, daughter, Injur Arlo, sister, are compulsorily invited and are treated with utmost respect. During Chomongkan, the male and female kin members aid to as support network to absorb the grief and loss of the disease. A Chomongkan cannot be performed without inviting them. The host need to invite the Kong Nihu, eldest maternal uncle, Ong Nihu, Soso Pili, and Injur Arlo of the disease. If they are not able to get the disease maternal uncle from the actual lineage, and if substitute are brought, the ritual of Hongwat Abiki to courtyard goat sacrifice, the goat snake is not severed at one stroke, which is considered disgraceful for the person who is a substitute from the same clan and a social embarrassment. The omen is also considered inauspicious for the host. It is believed that the goat which was offered to the disease by the person was not accepted. Sometimes it is believed that the performer of the Hongwan Abikitu will have a dream relevation the previous night, whether or not the sacrifice of the goat will go well. The host who is called Ari Asur and Rong Sarki village headmen are the people who are crucial to coordinate the complexity of Chomongkan. Chomongkan is a usually of three types. They are Kanplapla, Langtu, Harn, and Harne. The Kanplapla Chomongkan is the common Chomongkan usually performed by the Karbis in general. Langtuk and Harni Chomongkan are of higher status, but all these Chomongkan play the same primary roles of sanctifying the disease soul. The Chomongkan is held for four days and four nights. People come from different villages along with the Jambili Atong to participate in the Chomongkan. All four days consist of complex rituals practices devote to the liminal soul so that it can reunite with the ancestor. The soul is guided by the Lunse P. Dirt singer. Chorhe P. song is exceptionally lengthy and poetic. The poetic song of the Lamentations narrate the, the journey of the soul. After the poetic song, the soul will leave the body. It is believed that through the Chomongkans, when the soul leaves the earth, it reaches the ancestor village. Other important ritual functionaries in the Chomongkan are the Uchepi, cook of the disease, Kurusar priest, and Duhuidi, master drummer, Duhu Jang, assistant drummer, Kleng Sarpo, youth chief, and Kleng Dun, his chief deputy. The Duhuidi and his assistant Duhu Jang played an important role in the Chomongkan. The ritual is flagged off when Duhuidi and Duhu Jang start beating the drums. The Duhuidi and the Duhu Jang are always interconnected with the Lunsepi. Every drum beat indicates different steps to be performed, guiding the various rituals functions. Uh, it is when the Duhuidi and the Ari Asors bring the Jambili Atong totem of the Karbi from the Rong Sarke village headman to place on the courtyard of the host where the Chomongkan is held. While bringing the Jambili Atong, a huge procession take a place at night. Sorry for interrupting. Can you please make it short? Uh, yeah, uh, sure, sure, ma'am. Yeah. We are running um, short of time. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, the procession is called Rongketong and is participated by the community and guests from other villages. While bringing the Jambali Atong, they sing an erotic song called Kappa Air. This erotic song is sung for the dizzy soul. It is compulsory to sing Kappa Air by the male youth along with the drums dance for the dizzy soul. It is believed that the meaning of erotic song is reverse for the dizzy soul. It is melodious and beautiful song consists of lots of expletives. But this is mandatory to be performed at the feet of the disease known as King Pil. The song 
is supposed to be sarcastic with opposite meaning of the disease, but there are some authors like B. N. Bordoloi mentioned that Papa Air erotic song held special attractions for the Kirby youth boys to participate in Chomongkan, which seemed so shallow and ridiculous. What Mr. Bordoloi and his like had unfortunately could not understand in the verbal display of eroticism, erotic dances, and sexually suggestive community. Behavior during Chomongkan are all about. Maurice Flox and Jonathan Sperry had observed the significance of fertility and rebirth in funeral rituals, who pointed out to the notions of fertility and sexuality often have considered considerable prominence in funeral practices, which had attracted the attentions of anthropologists. The lifting social sections of display of sexually explicit verbal utterance and success and subjective dances during Chomongkan has to do with the ancient fertility rite which Kirby understood and had carried the tradition symbolically represent a kappa air verbal amnin so um uh, Jambini, uh, I, I will just jam it out actually. Uh, so, uh, Jambiliya Tong is a traditional woodcraft of the Kirby's as a particular carp from the Bengwai tree. Generally, it has five branches on the Atonpi. The main central branches sit the Wojaru, Bart, and Andu. For the four branches, sits Woralis and Woling. The birds are decorated with bits of reds, white, and cowries and black carols. Jambili Atong is placed on the courtier of the Chomongkan and Lunse piecing the origin of the beautiful craft. There is a Chong P and Nokjir are placed on the feet of Jambili Atong by the Klen Sarpo and Klendun. But in present day, Jambili Atong is also exhibited during the investiture ceremony of new traditional chief and for welcoming the dignitaries. According to the customary law, Jambili Atong can on, only be keep of the houses of Rong Sarthe, Baroi, Habi, and Pimpo houses. The totem is also considered as a representation of the five exogamous plants among Karbis. This so how verbal art play an important and significant role in the philosophy of life and death of the Karbi. The cultural symbolism of the Jambili Atong so as how material culture holds the identity of the Karbis. Uh, Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I will, I will just point it out that important. Uh, yeah. So now I will jump. Yeah. So the third, uh, Horchima is performed. So we would be uh, happy for, to discuss. With yeah, us. I will just make it short, ma'am. Yeah, I'm going to wind it up. Yeah, so uh, in uh, Chomongkans, uh, one of the uh, main important that is called Mosera. So, Horchimai offering rice, beers, and banta is performed for the Ongnihu, Suso, Fili, and Injir Arlo of the disease member. Here, the key member played important roles to please the disease soul. On the courtyard below the Jambalaya Tong, Mosera Kihir will take place initiated by the Ariyasur and Kleng Sarpo Kleng. Mosera Kihir, recalling the past, is a lengthy verse narrative, is breathless recital. The sacred verses of Mosera also describe the origin of the Kirby's other humans group from the hundreds of eggs of plug book, birds of bad family. The Mosera verses also describe the origins of migrations of the community with reference to the navel of the earth, the white mountain, the land of the Burmese and diverse societies and culture, and it's also described the Hogwarts Abikitu, courtyard good sacrifice. This ceremony is the um, scariest, but also performed to the amusement of the huge gathering which take place uh, as the diseases are being prepared for the final destination to the cremation. This is the last time that lots of performance are, are done by the king members and Ari so also is a repeat manner here. The meals perform the banjar yes, kefan. We are running short of time. Okay, okay, yeah. So yeah, uh, now is the last. So conclusion: these are brief narrations to understand the Chomongkhan as as an interpretations of life and death. Chomongkhan is not only about the immortal souls taking, but it is also important knowing their own kinship relations from one generation to the next, ranging from many decades and century of kinship. The kinship relations unite both the diseased soul and the living family members of the clan to understand the Kirby social anatomy. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Ampo. That was such a nice presentation, though a little bit long. It was so nice.
uh, for thank you for taking us to the Kabi uh, culture and the festivity side. Uh, open to the audience. Any questions from the audience? Yes, and uh, it's a humble request to all our presenters because we run short of time. Let us all make it to the point of discussion rather than reading it from your paper. We would uh, welcome uh, an open discussion on your topic, on uh, the area of your research. And uh, any questions to Ms. Ampo? No? Now, may I know if Dr. Parameshwar is here? Dr. Parameshwar Singh Maravi? No, ma'am. Uh, he does not join. Okay. And uh, Kari Riba? Yes, ma'am. I'm here. Ah, yeah. Riba is from a research scholar. Yes. Welcome. Over Hello, to you. Hello. Hope you're doing safe. Healthy? Yes, yes, ma'am. Nice to hear. Over to you. And uh, we would be happy if you give us a discussion on your area, on okay, your topic. Sure. Welcome. So, a uh, very good evening to everyone. Uh, before starting my presentation, I would like to extend my gratitude to Cape Common Trust and the organizers for this opportunity, as I have really had the privilege to learn from the enlightening presentations. Uh, so, the title of my presentation is Redefining Indigeneity Deconstructing Deficit Discourses. I would like to begin my presentation with a very popular line from an autobiographical work, Am I Black Enough for You? authored by Australian Aboriginal writer Anita Hayes. On quote, I'm Aboriginal. I'm just not the Aboriginal person a lot of people want or expect me to be. This line stipulates the universal undertone of the present day question on indigeneity. What is indigeneity? Or what are the ontological subscriptions that an indigene is bound to are of the many questions that form the primary ground of present day query into understanding indigeneity. So the presentation is divided in three parts to simplify this uh, very argument. The first part addresses issues of identity stereotyping. The second part focuses on deconstructing the relationship between indigeneity and modernity. And the third part is a reproach on epistemological reconsideration. So beginning from the first part, so the lengthy heritage of the term noble savage as an inscribed prefix to indigeneity and the cultural currencies that endorse the ever increasing gap between indigeneity and modernity has contributed to the grand narrative that situates natives or indigenous communities outside civilization. So while the motion to acknowledge ontological pluralism and the need for ontological turn has become the onus in redefining indigeneity across the disciplines of social sciences, this paper uses a comparative approach to focus on select indigenous writers from different geographical space as they share a resonating anxiety to dispel and deconstruct archetypes of the indigene status quo. And conceding on pluralism and uniqueness of culture across the First Nations, the universal ethos of articulating the self and the evident spirit of solidarity stems from an identifiably shared socio-political crisis surrounding these communities and the intricacies of these find expression in its literature. So in another book named Tidas, authored by Anita Hayes, she addresses the politics of identity and representation on code. She often repeated to herself, especially when working with people who brought their stereotypes, she was never going to fulfill someone else's stereotype of being black in Australia in the 21st century. So talking further on stereotyping, Pauline Clegg in Indigenous Storytelling, deconstruct, uh, Deconstructing the Archetype, comments on the problems of representation in media culture as he recounts the restrictive universal archetypes that iterates the lineage of deficit narratives. Um, quote unquote, I still sometimes get scripts from non-Indigenous writers where the Indigenous character is nondescript with no name or background to them. It is as if their backstory is still not important to the character. Several stereotypes arise. They include the noble savage 
who lives on the fringes of society to be rescued by the colonizer. These films portray our characters as subservient to the social structure of the colonized world. Uh, so while there are many layers to comprehending how and why archetype has become a universal symbol of indigeneity, one of the many queries voiced by indigenous writers is the authority of history and its role in meaning generation, which over a period of time constructs established truths. The established uh, legitimization of the imperial knowledge system that cornered other narratives, as in the words of Spivak uh, on quote, dislocated and unacknowledged, not only diminished, but near possibly erased the indigenous ontology as a historical absence. So now moving to the second part of the paper, which focus on, focuses on deconstructing the relationship between indigeneity and modernity. Uh, the rationale of this paper, as stated, to construe the relationship between indigeneity and modernity is one of the first challenges in the way of deconstructing the indigenous archetype. Mamang Dai, an indigenous writer from Arunachal, located in northeastern part of India, in her novel, Legends of Pensam, articulates the perplexed ground of ab aboriginal existence with an urge to be able to communicate beyond the limiting paradigms. She uses the word pensam to denote this unexplainable state of being. This word pensam, taken from Adi language variety, is a word to indicate the middle ground. So while the word has multiple layers to it, the same has been used to describe the perplexed state of negotiation between tradition and modernity. So another line from Mamang Dai's The Voice of the Mountain, unquote, we live in territories forever ancient and new. It necessitates an inquiry into the polarizing placement of indigeneity and modernity. So the concern here is to understand the connection and relationship between the two, as modernity, also used as a term to refer to period after the Victorian age, is interchangeably used to refer to advances in science and technology pertaining to contemporary taste. The concern here is thus to understand the relationship between time and modernity, demarcated by dates and years in conventional history, advancement in science, and ideologies and behavior in humanities. So interestingly, one is compelled to interrogate why then time is associated to indigeneity, one that is personal and ethnospecific. So the term first settlers has over a period of time become denotive of a time outside which the indigenous is not allowed to identify, where first no longer convey native, rather it insinuates the idea of an antique from the stone age. So responses on discourse of indigeneity has powerfully invaded different cultural platforms where the issue of nativity is being reapproached. Uh, one of the universal aspects of the documentaries and interviews of native people, mm, uh, which are available in e-platforms such as YouTube, resonates with the issue raised by Anita Heiss in her work, Am I Black Enough For You? That is the right to say who you are and the capacity to embrace your cultural history without fitting into the narrow archetype. So the natives take pride in boasting about their modern day jobs while hoisting the symbolism of the red feathers and headgears. Just for a more simplified reference, I would like to talk about one beautiful example. Uh, everyone must have watched the Marvel movie Black Panther, uh, which may be seen as a much needed discourse of popular culture that aims to make the masses question popular notions of primitivism, modernity, and indigeneity. As the movie beautifully crafts a plot around Wakanda, a consortium of scientific advancement in indigeneity, where one is not separate from the other. So coming to the last part, I hope I have enough time, the third part of the paper, that is the need for epistemological reconsiderations. So in his essay, Historical and Cultural Context to Native American Literature, Joy Potter argues, Indian literature informed by oral tradition operates within a different epistemology or way of knowing, invoking another way of categorizing meaning. The need to desynchronize with the conceived conceived way of knowing and the de-essentialization of the totality of discourse is essential in establishing a renewed paradigm of categorizing. Uh, so as I'm talking about renewed paradigm, I would like to talk about orality and indigeneity, 
as one's inseparable from the other. Uh, the philosophy of oral, as implicit in many indigenous communities in Northeast India, is founded on narratives of creation, myths of origin, tales of different types, and in almost all communities, migration stories, uh, which is also found in the story of Hoxto as he fell from the sky, in the legends of Pensam, and also in several uh, instances, like sightings of spirits of the dead in Esterine Kiri's A Terrible Matriarchy. However, the concept of myth that we have inherited from the Greeks belong by reason of its origin and history to a tradition of thought peculiar to Western civilization in which myth is defined in terms of what is opposed to reality and secondly, to what is not rational. It is in this line of thought and tradition with the tendency to draw from Western knowledge system and the collocation of fiction irrationality and absurdism to myth is the vitality and significance of orality further reduced. So categorizing these essential intricacies present in indigenous texts under the umbrella of myth and legends further reduces the oral capacity and amplifies the idea of a pre-literate existence attached to aboriginality. So uh, in her novel, Burma Red by Deborah McPie, a Native American writer, Please make it short. Okay, okay, I'll conclude now. So she questions the tendency of categorizing oral narratives under deficit paradigms as she juxtaposes the elements of supernatural to contemporary American social reality. So in doing so, she problematizes the concept of supernaturalism, primitivism, that is attached to orality by re-articulating a reality. Okay, so I'll just conclude here. Uh, so I think it is very necessary to approach indigeneity and pronounce indigenous identity in a renewed light, a discourse that does not follow a linear understanding of cultural progression and civilization, uh, where search for history is more than nostalgia and cultural roots is not divorced from progression. I came across this uh, very strong statement made in an interview of Aboriginal Australians that seems to encapsulate the entire argument in very simple words. So one quote from an interview, I am a neurology science, a neurology nurse, and my culture is alive everywhere I go. Identity as such becomes a product of hermeneutics, a process of exchange that is constantly evolving. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Riba. Thank you for the, that nice presentation. The bipolar journey from intelligence to modernity. And uh, now uh, it's a request from my end to Dr. Ramesh. Could you please uh, stop sharing your screen? Dr. Ramesh? Yeah, thank you. And uh, over to the audience, do you have uh, questions to pose to Riba? I think, uh, Riba, you have got a question uh, asking what is deficit discourse? Deficit discourse is actually preconceived notions, preconceived notions, which is advocated by politics of uh, representations during the colonial period. And as it is uh, after colonial period, we we have this entire discourse of post-colonial literature, but uh, there is a completely new argument which talks about paracolonialism, in which it talks about communities who have been uh, colonized for more than 200 years or even more than that, because of which uh, certain discourses become so attached to the identity that it becomes almost impossible to remove it. So yeah, these are deficit discourses which are uh, being revoked by the indigenous writers. Uh, the contemporary times. Uh, thank you, Ms. Riba. And that question was from Poshna. I hope uh, she would have got the answer. And uh, from my end, I would like to tell deficit uh, discourse means may, perhaps the discourse of uh, people who were uh, or who are always facing a deficiency, right? Uh, am I making it clear, Ms. Riba? Mm -hmm. Discourse of people who were always uh, facing deficiency in their life. Yeah, and also deficiency in context of what is uh, what is deficient in the Western knowledge. It may yeah. not necessarily be deficient, but it was portrayed as deficient. Okay, well, thank you, Ms. Reba. Any more questions to Ms. Reba from our audience? Uh, 
and uh, thank you mr riba thank you for that journey of bipolarity you have taken us to both the poles thank you so much uh, we'll get back to you if the audience have some other questions we'll get back to you and uh, now i would like to call upon ms isha can i have ms isha here yes ma'am welcome thank you ma'am uh, my topic is tribal india in indian english fiction indian oh. english fictions yes, uh, uh, generally come yes, from the elite section of the of the society oh, and deal with the general theme oh, yes ma'am uh, can you please make it short uh, with a discussion yeah sure ma'am i would request all uh, presenters to take uh, to the maximum of 5 to 6 minutes so that uh, because we are running uh, we have already late the planned schedule has been uh, prolonged so let us stick to time it's a request from my end to all the presenters to the maximum of 6 minutes okay ma'am uh, shall i start now yes please indian uh, english uh, writers generally come from the elite section of the society and deals with the general theme confronting the national and society tribal india is the other world for them arun joshi's the strange case of billy biswas kamla markandeya's the coffers dam manohar malonkar the princess geeta mehta's a river sutra and ruskin bond's short stories are few example of work that deals different aspects of the tribal india so first we talk about the novel strange case of billy biswas which revolves around bimal biswas in short and his encounter with the tribals in america billy come across with a swedish girl tula billy and tula share many intimate moments together After some years Billy come back to India and undertake a number of expeditions to investigate primitive communities sometime later he decide to marry Meena his belong uh, who belongs to his Bengal community but his marriage turns out to be unsuccessful Billy mysteriously vanishes leaving his wife child and his parents behind as a part of his search for primitive culture and his desire to be with them billy marries belasia a tribal woman and his obsession about her he writes quotes a strange woman keeps crossing my dream i have seen her on the street of delhi nursing uh, nursing a child in the shade of a tree or holding stone for a rich man's house i have seen her buying bangles at a fair I have seen her shadow at a tribal dance and I have seen her pensive and inviolable her clothes clinging to her wet body beside a tank in Banaras yes this woman keeps crossing my dreams causing me a fearful disturbance the full meaning of which i have yet to understand unquote the environment the instead of uh, instead of focusing on many uh, large factories and destroying the Uh, environment why can't we give chance to the small scale industries who are not letting higher impact on the environment your answer shows your love for uh, preserving nature That's yes ma'am right i now. have i do have ma'am thank you thank you hope uh, the questioner is satisfied with the answer yes uh, thank you yes, for the good yes thank you thank you leek clifford thank you thank you miss reshta thank you so much thank you ma'am thank you uh no shall i start yes, ma'am yes as usual please be time conscious thank you dr okay. reema i'll uh, try to keep it quick uh thank you so i am anchal daya i work as a, as an assistant professor in gurugram university and i'm going to talk about gender stereotypes in the plays of mahesh tatani so my definition my understanding of indigenous is a little more broad than uh, what i've been listening to uh, since morning uh, okay although tatani is an indian english playwright yet his crisp dialogues contain the natural rhythm of a bilingual speaker whether his character belongs to gujarat karnataka or any other state in india 
the speech patterns vocabulary and especially the issues of marginality and voicelessness uh, voicelessness are essentially indigenous in nature so this research paper will attempt to view the plays uh, dance like a man and bravely fought by the queen uh, bravely fought the queen by mahesh datani through the prism of gender stereotypes gender stereotypes are the fixed roles and features that are attributed to a particular gender based on some preconceived notions prevalent in a particular culture at a given point of time gender stereotypes assume that certain specific traits of behavior are intrinsic to that particular gender it is common mis misconception that gender stereotypes are always negative or that they affect only women stereotypes can be harmful for the growth of individuality of any gender in her work gender troubles judith butler elucidates the concept of gender performativity according to her gender roles are maintained through socially constructed gender displays now every aspect of our, of our discourse is embedded with gender stereotypes popular culture is saturated with gender stereotypes which represent women with characteristics like subservience obedience chastity fidelity etc at the same time women who assert their independence and individuality in this patriarchal world would have been portrayed on negative lines at the same time these gender stereotypes portray men to be independent reasonable and assertive beings who are always in control of their emotions literature cinema ancient texts philosophical texts religious texts mythology etc support the stereotypes related to gender and sexuality manu smriti an ancient indian text in hinduism makes many such comments which border on being derogatory um for instance it mentions that girls should be in the custody of their father when they are children women should be under the care of their husband when they are married and a widow should be taken care of by her son a woman should not be allowed to assert her independence and express her individuality under any circumstance now it is heart wrenching to observe that these dictums of ancient in society are still prevalent in a significant part of india gender stereotyping is a menace not just in india but most of the cultures around the world thrive on patriarchal ideas aristotle asserted that women naturally lack rationality and intelligence as their bodies lack the necessary warmth that creates intellect christianity a religion which is adored by 30% people globally propagates that a woman was created out of a man's rib thereby giving a subordinate position for women in comparison with the men mahesh datani of the seminal writer of in english literature becomes voice of marginalized and the oppressed in the society datani works within conventional frameworks and realizes the futile nature of this in a society which is burdened under the weight of normativity through his dramatic discourse datani has continuously struck to portray intricacies of gender sexuality is Works often tie modernity with truth. On one hand, they portray the transforming point in post-colonial India, while on the other hand, he acknowledges that Indian society is still under the clutches of hegemonic masculinity. Dance Like a Man by Manish Patel is a play which deals with the chronotropes of three generations of Gujarati family in post-colonial India. Uh, play ups are the transformation of a person. opinions and attitudes with the three generations the title of the play consists of two keywords man and gender and culture are entwined in a single thread to that the foundation of gender perceptions the sovereignty of the phallus in words of uh, phallus is changed by challenge the idea of male dancer jaj who is passionate about about his dance this play natyam which is a dance from indigenous to tamil nadu We perform the days that is, which the act. This makes the act of just even more brilliant. As uh, the uh, Mahesh Datani observes, no other uh, dance form has a fascinating history of oppression and anesa as Bharatnatyam. Jairaj Datani portrays that fixed gender norms can stifle the individuality of a person. Jairaj depicts the identity crisis of a man who dared to express his individuality through the medium of dance. which is traditionally considered a feminine pursuit he has to pay the price for going against heteronormative societal codes and is marginalized and belittled by his own father and wife uh jera does not confirm with the heteronormative codes which propagate a phallocentric ideology and amritpal his father feels the need to normalize him and to mold him into the traditional patriarchal structure where a man is supposed to exhibit masculine qualities 
uh, although Ratna, his wife, is an ambitious and progressive woman for whom her career off as a dancer is uh, of prime importance, her patriarchal upbringing has conditioned her to internalize the stereotypical image of a perfect man. She unconsciously desires her husband to have assertive and masculine traits. Another stereotypical issue which is uh, brought to the fore by the Tani is commodification of women. Dance is primarily associated with women because uh, a dancer is subjugate, uh, subjected to male gaze and the sexuality of a presenter of dance is considered part of the whole package. <clears throat> uh, the next uh, play that we're going to talk about is Bravely Fought the Queen by the Tani. It's a play in which the playwright, uh, the, that is the Tani, aims to fracture the typical notions of gender and sexuality. The problems, he problematizes the status of women in contemporary society. The claustrophobic world of the women in the play, Dolly uh, and uh, Alka, uh, um, women, Dolly and Alka in the play, highlights the stereotypical framework within which patriarchy functions. Maintaining an identity becomes a Hobbes' choice for the women in the play. Issue of homosexuality is covered through Praful and Nitin, who share a love that, uh, I quote, a love that dare not speak its name. The title of the play, Bravely Fought the Queen, has been taken up from a poem by Subhadra Kumari Chauhan, whose first line, Khub Ladi Mardani Voto, Jhansi Wali Rani Thi, can be translated as, So bravely fought the Banli Queen, so bravely fought the Queen of Jhansi. Through the example of two freedom fighters, Rani Lakshmi Bai and Subhadra Kumari Chauhan, the title aptly depicts the spirit of modern women to break through the gender stereotypes and develop an individual identity for themselves. At the same time, the Tani subtly questions that traditionally, that traditionally qu the quality of bravery is associated with only male gender. There is no uh, word in our culture which denotes a brave woman, and hence the word Mardani, which is which means manly, is used in the original poem as a compliment. Now, in in the play Seven Against Thieves, the playwright Ascylus in 467 BC wrote, "Let the women stay at home and hold their peace." The Tani emphasizes that these age-old stereotypes are still prevalent in our contemporary society and are eating away the very flesh of our aspiring nation. Uh, in a patriarchal structure, women discern their identity through the male members in their relation. Uh, hence, there is a strong need in the beginning of the play to identify Lalita as someone's wife. The desperate attempts of Dolly and Alka to persuade their husbands to go somewhere, anywhere, depicts the marginalization and exploitation in a traditional patriarchal setup. Uh, Jitin is a violent and dominating man who represents the idea of toxic masculinity. The phallic power invested in Jitin by the society leads him to behave in an aggressive and vicious manner. He is unapologetically violent and exercises complete patriarchal control over his wife. The relationship among the women in the play help to determine the manner in which patriarchy functions through proliferation of dominant ideology and also through naturalization of hegemonic patriarchal ideas. The character of Dolly, who eventually gets tired of the restlessness, patriarchal hegemony, fights back. And the play depicts resistance of women against the domination and male domination and orthodoxy. Just like the legendary queen, uh, Jansi, Dolly challenges the existing gender roles and delimits the patriarchal hegemony. So, uh, hence, uh, in conclusion, the gender stereotypes uh, have led to the internalization of gender roles in our society, and this results in oppression and ostracization of individuals who go, who go against these fixed norms. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Now, as you said, as you mentioned earlier before presenting, you have taken us to some, uh, I mean, uh, to an extent, apart from the indigenous life, but still such a nice topic on Mahesh Dadani's place. Thank you for analyzing the stereotypes. Uh, audience, you, any questions to Ms. Anchal? <clears throat> no questions? Okay, Ms. Anchal, thank you for that nice presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And now uh, I would like to call upon uh, Dr. Alka Jain, our last presenter of uh, this session, Tales and Batsman. Dr. Alka.
Dr. Alka, it's your turn. Please come back. It shows that she is here, logged in. Uh, she has just uh, joined us. I think she was somewhere else. Ma'am, uh, can you please unmute yourself and start your presentation? We were waiting for you. Unmute yourself, ma'am. Yes, Dr. Alka. Yeah. Uh, very good evening to all the organizers and um, also to all the people who have presented their papers here and uh, i thank you all for providing me with this opportunity to present my paper before uh, the conference and uh, without taking a lot of time i would like to move to my topic the topic that i am going to speak on my paper is on societal catalysis in determining the impact of climate change and natural disasters on women now uh, as the world is grappling with the greatest catastrophe of the modern times in the shape of COVID-19 pandemic in disbelief and fear, it, uh, the world is also coming on terms with the reality of the inevitable and gradual degradation which is being caused by climate change. It is indeed a strange revelation that a woman's role and, so, uh, and status in society determines the impact of natural and environmental factors like climate change, droughts and floods upon her. Nature, which is otherwise spared the charges of promoting and propagating gender biases in human society, becomes an indirect instrument in the hands of power and patriarchal hierarchy, thereby aggravating gender divide and causing immense half, harm to one half of the human civilization. Now, while a majority of women-centric feminist researchers focus on society, religion, culture, politics, social codes, and all institutions, including the family, as agents of female suppression. They seldom talk about how nature too gets entwined in the vicious human circle and acts as a weapon destroying the lives and sanity of women. The prey of the masculine world, that is the women, becomes a favorite uh, victim of natural calamities too. A major concern of my paper is uh, that it seeks to understand how power dynamics between men and women in society influences the impact of climate changes and natural disasters at all fronts, regardless of being old or young, rural or urban, educated or illiterate, working or economically dependent, caste, color or creed. Women of all strata suffer environmental hardships more severely than the males. A major concern is that climate change threatens human society by endangering the resources. The distribution of the reduced resources then becomes a major concern. And it is here that power games and hierarchical society, social structures come into action. Since an overwhelming portion of the world's political and financial uh, leadership is governed by patriarchal representatives, women have little say in the decision-making process. Thus, they become more vulnerable to polarized decisions. This global patriarchal system pollocates to the local level too. And the women, even in the smallest institutional unit, which is the home, is denied the power of resource, planning, and decision making during an environmental calamity or shift. As a 2007 study conducted by the London School of Economics shows, taken a sample of up to 141 countries over a period of 19 uh, period from 1981 to 2002 natural disasters and their subsequent impact on average kill more women than men or kill women at an earlier age than men this is mostly related to a woman's lower socio economic status the reason for women being more vulnerable to disasters calamities or climatic change is not the catastrophe itself but the women's already established socio-economic and political status. These pre-disaster weaknesses are present in the form of innumerable restraints and constraints binding women for centuries. Economic disparity, dependency on males, lack of education and health facilities, malnutrition, social norms and codes, prejudices and gender bias are man-made impediments. Alarmingly, they are the catalysts that participate in women degradation during calamities and hasten the process of their ruination and subjugation. But what we fail to understand is that
that in doing so they also render the society weak and unstable despite being marginalized the female population of the world contributes significantly to all economic and social activities either directly or indirectly if the alarming and reactionary source, uh, societal uh, factors debilitating feminine uh, development are not taken into account then the impact of climate change and disasters will be globally consequential now i would like to show some uh, instances without going into the definition of climate change all the factors are uh, uh, of a calamity or a disaster are aggravated in the developing countries because women are unaware of their rights and privileges and lack the courage to redefine womanhood by breaking their shells in developing countries women are already dealing with several financial issues lack of education skill development impacts their decision making leadership and managerial abilities having little or no exposure to major welfare policies and access to information and news they hardly get informed about the impending disasters at the right time even during the current covid-19 pandemic times it has been observed that women especially the poor and illiterate depend upon secondary sources or info on uh, sources for information and believe what they hear all of which hampers with their understanding of the magnitude of the disease added to it are the existing issues of emotional psychological and mental deprivation which catapults into potent dangers to the feminine world responses and responsibility both are missing on their part a look at the social fabric of india depicts the callousness with which it treats the gendered world lack of healthcare makes females a ready victim socially women consider their health of little consequence and their nutritional physical wellness and health are issues which are thrust under the carpet early marriages early motherhood and lack of sanitation have already burdened the indian woman stigma against widows and other downtrodden women and female activism is highly prevalent domestic violence and sexual harassment are grim realities that have impacted the mental and emotional well-being of the female population but this is also happening in other countries following a major australian flood in 1990 one observer noted that women experiencing violence in the home who were socially isolated became even more isolated and there was an increase in domestic violence according to who the who further states that the division of social roles and responsibilities play an important role in aggravating women degradation women de degradation during disasters in the face of these challenges if a disaster approaches the women population readily succumbs vasudha gokhale mentions that in the indian uh, ocean tsunami on december 26 2004 it took away lives of more than 12000 people displaced 650000 people and injured as many and in this event more women and children died in the worst affected areas of tamil nadu post disasters also women suffer in a number of ways like social stigmatization due to widowhood and psychological issues related to it orphaning of females who become more vulnerable to assaults withdrawal of education and other benefits sexual and physical assault by other and the family members pressure to maintain silence lack of legal help lack of privacy in shelter homes responsibility to maintain the family increase in domestic violence and so on and so forth it has been reported that post disasters issues of sexual and physical harassment domestic violence etc receive little or no importance because women have very little representation at the decision making level at home as well as in the nation grappling with ostracization and discontinuity of normalcy the struggle with scarcity is become diabol uh, diabolically threatening the traditional social core surrounding womanhood their biological makeup reproductive and maternal needs and the socio political environment add to a woman's sorrows by creating high walls and limiting her opportunities and access to post disaster recovery services the fao recognizes that across the world women make up nearly 50% of agricultural employment as farmers and farm workers horticulturalists and market sellers business women entrepreneurs and community leaders they fulfill important roles throughout the agri food value chains as well as in the management of natural resources like land and water 
as agriculture is the most vulnerable to climate change and women play an important role in it from food production to utilization livestock management collection of water and the like they cannot escape the debilitating impact of climate change in the case of global warming there will be negative effects on soil conditions leading to a direct repercussion on agricultural production flooding causes a great threat especially in the coastal areas loss of land and agriculture due to over flooding and salinity of soil lack of drinking water loss of habitat and water borne diseases are the major impediments when there is water scarcity and agriculture cannot be practiced men migrate in search of labor women are forced to assume the responsibilities that were traditionally kept aside for men but they fail to carry them out with authority and expertise neither uh, neither do they have the requisite resources and finances to facilitate their role reversal water scarcity and lack of other resources lead to immense loss of agricultural produce and livestock it is generally the work which is carried out by the women folk and now it becomes more challenging as water storage is a major work of women in most countries scarcity of water implies that women have to travel a greater distance in search of water and spend considerable time and energy to collect it therefore they fail to do anything productive like engaging in a regular economic activity education or skill development women and children comprise of the majority of displaced population and undergo harsh severities in the process of migration they have to pass through perilous routes and vicious human traffickers even if they manage to be alive society does not accord them a dignified status many are forced to turn to prostitution or bonded labor a vast number of climate change mitigation policies fail to look at the gender equation in urban cities as a prospective threat most policies study the impact of climatic changes on the rural women but for the urban urban women too climate change and natural calamities pose innumerable challenges large scale migration to the urban areas due to lack of rural employment causes overcrowding and poor living conditions in the urban places people are forced to live in cramped homes and here too the poor urbanites face more difficulties than the rich water scarcity is an urban reality and often people develop several water borne infections and diseases the urban women also faces a lot of several uh, uh, a lot of health issues related to herself and the family tending to the sick which is generally considered a feminine duty in societies play havoc in the lives of urban working women who have to look after the sick the hurt the children while trying to achieve economic stability in the aftermath of natural calamities like earthquakes or flooding in urban areas women are the worst sufferers more women and children die during floods earthquakes and storms in cities than men health safety security provision of shelters are major concern for a women for women living in cities lack of awareness and training to deal with disasters is also a cause of concern in cities women like the rural counterparts are majorly engaged in unpaid employment and hence financially financial security is a looming concern in the face of a calamity a single woman managing a home becomes very vulnerable as she lacks the support post disaster the working women are pressurized to return to their jobs even though they might be deeply troubled at the home front women working as house helps nurses teachers etc have to resume work dual duties at home and work pro prove detrimental the mobility of urban women during natural disaster is compromised and access to the frugal resources like even transportation becomes a challenge in case of global warming urban women faces several crises working and living in cramped surroundings and the immense heat is a threat to their health and cause of mental stress and anxiety the urban women lack cooling facilities at their major workplace that is the kitchen we did that can we make it flap yeah yeah surely ma'am i'm just going to uh, the end ma'am um societal gender divide is thus detrimental to women equality and social equilibrium and a roadblock in a country's progress gender justice has thus been incorporated as one of the major sustainable goal by the undp in order to attain sustainable development the world cannot progress if half the population lags behind and is accorded a subaltern status the convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women adopted in 1979 provides an insightful 
framework for linking climate change with the protection of women from harms caused by climate related vulnerabilities and advancement of gender equality incorporation of women in all thematic discussions and policy making programs related to mitigation of environmental threats sensitivity to gender issues and female upliftment need to be the focus of all agenda and agencies working for environmental concerns the capabilities sensitivities and wisdom of women folk require sharpening and acceptance for the justifiable and wise use of natural resources with this i come to the end of my paper and uh, thank you to all of you to be uh, hearing my paper thanks a lot thank you dr analyzing all uh, factors which uh, which are catalytic in uh, determining i mean uh, the fate of women let me yes. be uh, frank now thank you so much for that paper and uh, i think dr shubhra uh, that's the end of the presentation session yeah thank you so much ma'am uh, is there any question any questions from the side of the audience because uh, the audience is actually a question alpha ma'am yeah uh, but i would like to say that uh, somewhere as in the beginning of your uh, session that you had said that um, nature never uh, you know biases between male and female but somehow through your data and the presentation i feel even the nature has pushed women toward the most subaltern corners uh, again so uh, it was a really a new insight for me at least uh, how to look at disasters now Yes. Uh, natural disasters thank you so much alpha thank you so much sir thank you so much sir so actually i have i have uh, i just like to add something like uh, i have done my thesis on feminist uh, concerns and uh, i have studied 10 uh, plays of mahesh dattani and girish karnad for my study but uh, right now i have changed my perspective uh, towards environment because teaching in an uh, agricultural university i realize that all the aspects of feminism which i have been studying in literature they apply so well in the real life too Um, so that's one consideration. That's why you know I thought of presenting this paper on this platform. Uh, very new thank perspective. You, thank you. Thank you. Right choice to be presented, and uh, thank you, Mr. Abhimanyu, for being. Uh, so you know that thank it was a safe side goal on your part. You were there to be voice for uh, the women, and uh, I should actually uh, all presenters, all those six presenters, they were. Uh, uh it's terribly good they were all there with uh, long discussions papers i mean exploring new areas new domains uh, where they would not have thought and uh, perhaps when they were all at home mother earth is healing nature is restoring back to its normal uh, condition and uh, these people were the right uh, ones to be dealt with in this situation uh, so we are all locked down uh, by this pandemic Was so all of the organizers to come out with such a virtual conference from all over the world, uh, and uh, that should be underlined. Uh, we had participants and uh, contributors from all over the world, and it was really nice of uh, Dr. Rajin and Dr. Shubha to be up with uh, such a nice concept in this uh, challenging period. And from the end of the organizers, I would like to thank uh, every presenter uh, and uh, the audience being here. about the day uh yes okay dr shubha thank you thank you so much ma'am uh thank you dr s rama devi for uh, chairing uh, this session such a in such a lively and wonderful manner thank you ma'am for joining us thank you and congratulations to all the paper presenters and thank you all for joining us today and uh, there is an announcement for tomorrow all of us will join at 8:30 indian standard time as we are going to be joined by our keynote uh, speaker dr uh, priscilla sethi from canada so uh, see you all thank you for joining us see you all tomorrow at 8:30 indian standard time bye bye take care thank you bye bye bye